This is homegrown root ginger. This is ginger wine, something that I really love in the winter. Today, we're going to look at how to turn this into this. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the kitchen. My name's Hugh, and today I want to fight the winter blues caused by those grey days where it's all a bit drizzly and rainy and cold and damp and horrible. Best way of doing that is to make something hot and fiery and sweet and exciting. Ginger wine. We've had a great success this year growing homegrown ginger. And we've got masses of the stuff, which is fabulous. And that gives me an opportunity to make ginger wine. Now, ginger wine is not like a sort of grape wine. It's hot, it's fiery, it's sweet. And it's gonna need a few different techniques than ones that we traditionally use for our hedgerow wines. But I promise you, it's totally, totally worth it. And this is our spin on ginger wine. So let's show you how we do it. I'm not going to show you how to grow ginger in this video, but I am going to make a video on ginger growing because we've had tremendous interest in it. Suffice it to say, it's perfectly possible to grow root ginger in the UK in an unheated greenhouse or a conservatory. What I do want to tell you about today's ginger wine video is I'm going to make a downloadable recipe sheet for everything you see in today's video. I'll put a link down in the description. You can download it from our website so that you know it's safe. And I'll update it when we do a part two video on stabilizing and back sweetening so that you'll have a full fact sheet for the whole process. This is a kilo of root ginger. It might look a little bit unusual to you, rather paler and more yellow than the root ginger you're used to seeing. And that's because it's fresh. We harvested this yesterday. And actually, although I'm calling it root ginger, really, these are sort of storage tubers or corms that grow below the top growth, just at the surface of the compost or soil. And there's proper roots down below them. And this is really where the plant stores its energy for future growth. But it's also where a lot of flavor is concentrated. So that's why we're gonna use it today. Now, I've made this recipe before with shop-bought ginger and shop-bought ginger is absolutely fine. And although a kilo sounds a lot, root ginger is actually remarkably well priced so this amount of ginger will cost you about five pounds in the shops so don't worry if you need to go and buy that amount of ginger thankfully you don't have to peel the ginger for this recipe what you do have to do is make sure that there is no dirt on the surface so i'm just using a stiff brush a little nail brush and i'm giving it all a scrub in some clean water now one thing you will notice in certain areas, it's really hard to get the brush in. So just snap the ginger apart so you can get rid of anything that's caught. There we are then, that's a kilo of root ginger. Now in order to get the flavor out of that, we need to boil it up in some water for around about an hour. And for that to work effectively, it needs to be in much smaller pieces. I like to reduce it with a sharp knife, by like chopping it up into fairly small pieces. I'll then take those pieces and I'll put them into a blender, give them a good whiz in the blender, which I like because it contains all the juices and the liquid from the fresh ginger. And then I'll put all of that, the pulp and pieces and liquid that's given off into a pan and add the water. If you haven't got any of that, like a blender, you can just grate it. It just takes a while because a kilo of root ginger is quite a lot. With the ginger cut up, we need to blend it. We want to get it down to a sort of grated, fine pulp consistency. The way I found best is to split it into about four batches 
and blend it with some water in the blender because it's dry fibrous material and it won't tend to sort of fall naturally to the bottom as you blend it but if you mix it with a bit of water it does i find each batch i want to go in once or twice with a wooden spoon push everything to the bottom give it another quick blitz but it works fairly fast and it's a lot easier than grating a kilo of ginger although that's fine if that's what you want to do I've grated my ginger, I'm going to put it in a big steel pan and I'm going to add three litres of water to it and I'm going to do that using the jug because I get then to wash out all the little bits of stuck ginger and all the gingery juice and all that goodness. Then we're going to add some other ingredients to the pan. We're going to add 500 grams of chopped raisins because the wine otherwise will lack mouthfeel and body and it feels a bit thin and spicy but not sort of well rounded so it adds what's called venosity to add some grape juice or some chopped raisins i prefer chopped raisins i'm also going to add some actual spices two chopped chilies that we grow here ourselves that adds a bit of fire and a bit of heat leave it out if you want a milder dish then we're going to add four cardamom pods two sticks of cinnamon and i'm also going to add the zest and the juice of four unwaxed lemons if you can't get unwaxed lemons get the wax saw scrub them under the hot tap with your nail brush before you zest them and juice them to get all that goodness into the wine now adding the lemons will slightly increase the acidity of the wine which makes it more yeast friendly and that's good it also adds another flavor note to the wine Well, all of our wonderful spicy ingredients are in that pan. What am I going to do now? Put it on to boil, bring it to a boil, and then put it to a gentle simmer. I'm going to leave it there for an hour simmering. And in that hour, what's going to happen is it's going to infuse the water with all those wonderful flavours that we've added. After an hour, I'm going to take it off the heat and we're going to add one and a quarter kilos of this. This is Mauritius Muscovado sugar. Now, it doesn't have to be from Mauritius, but do get Muscovado sugar for this recipe. Raw, dark cane sugar. We want the colour. We want that lovely kind of treacly, dark taste that goes so well with the ginger. Once then the liquid's cooled to room temperature, I'm going to add some pectic enzyme. And the pectic enzyme will break up any pectin that's present in the fruit and vegetables. Pectin, wonderful thing, strands of protein, it's what sets your jam. But in wine, it can make the wine cloudy. And we want to break it up for that reason. Now, if we leave it overnight with a pectic enzyme in, that will do the job for us perfectly. Welcome to day two of ginger wine. We've left that pectic enzyme in the must overnight. And that will have now broken down any strands of pectin in the wine must that would have caused us problems and cloudiness later on. We've got a few more jobs to do today. First thing I want to do is get the volume of liquid in the wine must up to the sort of four and a half litres, one gallon we're going to need for the demijohn. Now we put three litres in yesterday. But of course we heated it for now, so we'll have lost some liquid through evaporation there. So I'm going to assume we've got two and a half litres of liquid left, which means I need to add another two litres of lukewarm water to the wine must to get it up to that four and a half litres. Then I'm going to strain some of that liquid and I'm going to measure its specific gravity. The specific gravity is sort of the density of the liquid and we measure it using a piece of equipment called a hydrometer. When we float it, it's got a scale on the side. And if we measure the specific gravity of the liquid before and after fermentation, we can do a very simple calculation with the difference between those two numbers to work out how much alcohol we produce, which is good. And the next thing I'm going to do is create a yeast starter culture. And I've got a stash here of this. This is from a company called Cross Maloof Brew and it's Christmas pudding wine yeast. You don't have to buy that, but it does give a wonderful finish to this rich, sweet, spicy wine. But you need a high alcohol wine yeast. So a port wine yeast or a champagne wine yeast would work absolutely fine. This isn't one for a general purpose wine yeast. And I'm gonna add that to some lukewarm apple juice. I'll leave it for 15 minutes just to rehydrate it, get it starting to ferment, and then we'll pitch that into the wine. 
And lastly, we're going to set that wine up using some special equipment to keep it warm and we're going to primary ferment it in a lidded bucket for about four days. That fermentation can get quite violent. If you try and do it in a demijohn, it can just foam through the airlock. So we'll do primary fermentation in a lidded bucket with an airlock. And then we'll transfer it to a demijohn once that's over. And we're going to ferment with the ginger and with the raisins, all of that in the liquid while we do that primary ferment fermentation. We'll strain it before we transfer it to the demijohn. With that done, we're going to put the wine on a heat pad. Now, heat pad is just a plastic square and it's got a small heating element in it and it serves two purposes, at least for us. This is an old, old cottage. We don't know how old. It's certainly documented back to the mid 1700s, but a lot of the bricks are a lot older than that. The floors get cold, particularly the quarry tiles and flag floors. You can feel the heat to go through them. There's no foundations there. There's no insulation under the floor. So they are a source of cold. And for a really good break, you need your wine must to sit at around 20 to 25 centigrade, 70 to 80 Fahrenheit. And the risk here is particularly at night, that temperature would plummet and that will detract from the quality of the brew. So by using a heat pad, it serves two purposes. It insulates the wine must from the floor and it emits very gently a little bit of heat in just to keep those temperatures up. And honestly, I do find it massively improves the quality, particularly if you're making wine or beer in the winter. Now, as you can tell by looking at them, ours are old, they're scratched, we've had them 20 plus years, but thankfully Fiona doesn't agree with throwing old and ugly things away, otherwise I wouldn't be making this video for you. So, you know, they work. Now, there are other options out there, and I haven't used them all, but there's certainly an immersion heater type approach to keep your wine warm. There's also what's called belts, which wrap around the outside of your brewing vessel. But because of our cold floors, the heat pads work the best for us in our situation. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to let that wine ferment as a primary fermentation, the violent fermentation, in the primary fermentation vessel, the lidded bucket, for about four days. Then, strain off the fruit, transfer it to a sterilized demijohn, fit an airlock, and we'll let it continue its fermentation in there. A few days have gone by, and our violent fermentation, our primary fermentation, has now ended. So the big rush of gas and bubbles as the yeast really gets active on all that available sugar is over. I wish you could smell the wine. It smells stunning. It's got a great sort of molasses treacly note from all that muscovado sugar, but the ginger comes through really strongly as well. It's got almost a sort of Caribbean rum vibe going on with it. Smells incredible. Doesn't look great. Let's take a look into the primary fermenter and what you can see in there is lots and lots of pieces of ginger from where that came from the food processor, the finer stuff. And there's also sort of some dark brown blobs in there. Those are the sort of raisins that we put in to give some venosity. What we need to do now is get ourselves a clean, sterilized demijohn. In fact, we need two. And we're going to strain off this one, get rid of all the solids in a two-stage process. The first step is Take a clean, sterilised, empty jammy drum, fit a funnel, and then fit a fine sieve. And we'll strain all the wine through that fine sieve, and that'll get rid of all the big stuff. Once we've done that, we're going to take a second demi drum, refit the funnel, clean sieve, and we'll put some cloth in it. And we'll strain it again through the cloth. And that cloth will catch all the fine pieces of ginger from the chopping of the food processor, catch some of the yeast sediment and anything else that's really small and floating around. And that'll make our wine much easier to clear when we come to the end of the process. Once we've double filtered the wine, what we're going to do, we'll fit an airlock, we'll put it back on the heat pad in the demijohn, and we'll let that carry on till all the bubbling ceases. And that's a good indication that fermentation is finished, but we can check that by using our hydrometer. And once the reading gets to a certain level, you can be confident that all dissolved sugar has turned to alcohol. There it is. It's brown, it's still quite cloudy, but there's no solids in it. We fitted an airlock. And what we're gonna do now is pop that back on the heat pad and let the fermentation complete. And we'll leave it there, it's quite safe, 
until no more bubbles are rising through that airlock. And after that, we'll test it, make sure the fermentation is complete, test the specific gravity of the wine, then we'll move on to the next step. And the next step is clear all those solids out of the wine, get it to a nice, even brown, dark brown, sticky, rich wine. Then what we can do is stabilize it, which basically stops fermentation restarting because all this fermentation is going to take all the sugar out of the wine. So instead of being beautifully sweet, it will actually become quite a dry wine. But by stabilizing it, we can stop the yeast starting again, then add back some more sweetness to get to that lovely, dark, dessert, rich, sweet wine that we're looking for. If you've enjoyed today's video, can you spare us five seconds and give us a thumbs up down below? We'd love to hear more from you about the kinds of wines and drinks you'd like to see. So please leave us a comment. Tell us if this is the kind of stuff you want or let us know what other wines you would like to see us make or beers, flavoured spirits. And we'll try and make those videos for you. And if you want to see them and the part two of this video and everything else we do on Self-Reliant Living, just tap on subscribe down there and the bell next to it if you aren't already subscribed to the channel. It's completely free, but then you get to hear every time we upload a new video. For today, thanks for watching. Come back and see us soon. Take care.